right uh, so over exploitation is one of the the major issues as you can see here and followed by the coastal development and the inland pollution and the marine pollution right so though coral reefs are in the marine environment the majority of actually the impact come from this over exploitation of resources or the uh, the some inland issues as well as the the coastal constructions as well right um and then here showing the the impacts of coral reefs in different areas. Uh, blue indicates the low risk, dark blue medium, and the, the red color indicates the high risk. Um, I don't see much many areas with the light blue. I mean, you see the dark blue and the red. You see right around the Sri Lanka and Indian part. And a lot of areas in the South Asia, Southeast Asia, you see the whole red color, um, including the Caribbean. But uh, the Pacific Ocean, fairly uh, good. Doing better. It's not really good, but it's at least doing better than us. Right. So our reefs are really um, doing very bad. <clears throat> All right. Um, there are some facts about the corals that uh, how much of the corals are being damaged. The 58% of the reefs are damaged due to the, the human activities. 90% of the reefs are overfished. You can imagine the, the what kind of an impact they would have, right? And on the other hand, from the protection side, uh, among the coastal nations, there are 40 countries in the world, they have no even a single protected area, right? Uh, and even if they have a protected areas, they are not well managed, like in Sri Lanka. We have few protected areas, uh, but we are not very satisfied with, with, like, with the what type of uh, protection that they are, uh, the type of protection that, that they are giving to the coral reefs. So, for example, in the Fijian Island, other than issuing a ticket, I don't see any anything that they, the responsible people have done anything to protect the people, protect the coral reefs, right? So that's so unfortunate. Um, <clears throat> so the, now we are into the, the best of part of the, the the, our discussion that's the how we can intervene or how, what we can do right there are some few things that we can do as individual but most of these issues are uh, more global and more regional level so not individuals can do but uh, where you need a lot of cooperation and collaboration uh, that we need to think of right uh, this is one of the examples uh, one of the organizations, I think it's called the World Resources Institute. Um, they're doing many projects. One of the projects is that they have this called the Reefs at Risk. It's one of the projects. Uh, it's very much on the awareness of awareness for the people for protecting the coral reefs. Um, they have a small video where you can Watch that one too. Hello, I'm Celine Cousteau. I'd like to talk about the vital role coral reefs play in the health of our planet. Not only the health of our oceans, they also play a vital role in our health and our economy. Corals are, in a sense, animal, mineral, and vegetable. Corals may look like rock, but they're actually little animals called polyps, which live in colonies. They filter feed at night and form their rock-like structures by secreting limestone. Inside the tissue of each polyp lives a kind of algae, which uses sunlight to synthesize food for the polyp. The polyp and the algae are dependent on one another for food and shelter. Coral reefs are the cradle of life in the ocean. It's where an enormous food web begins. 
It's where much of our food web begins. Coral reef fish provide a critical source of protein for millions of people around the world. You may not realize that coral reefs provide so much more to us than just seafood. Animals that live on the coral reef create unique chemicals that aren't found on land. These chemicals are used to make important medicines and food supplements. Reefs also provide an important barrier to protect coastal communities from storms and erosion. Healthy coral reefs also attract divers and tourists and help to create the businesses that support them. But the way we're harvesting seafood is destroying the reefs and all the potential the reefs have to provide for us in the future. We're taking fish from the ocean at a rate that's completely unsustainable, sometimes using destructive methods like poison and blast fishing. This disrupts an ecosystem that's been in balance for a very long time. Certain species flourish at the expense of other species. With the removal of plant-eating fish, algae grow rampant and smother the coral. And we're harming reefs in other ways too. Runoff from farms, industry, and coastal construction can bury coral reefs with sediment and pollution, create algae blooms, and kill corals. Our warning seas are causing coral bleaching, a process where polyps lose their colorful algae and turn pale. This further weakens the reefs. And because the ocean is absorbing so much of that extra carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere, it is becoming more acidic, which is making it harder for corals to grow. At present, 60% of all reefs on the planet are already threatened by local activities, namely overfishing and pollution. Unless we can slow climate change and reduce overfishing and pollution, by 2030, 90% of coral reefs will be threatened. By 2050, virtually all reefs will be threatened. Without coral reefs, we'll not only lose an important food source, but many communities will also lose their tourism and fishing economies, and the coasts will be much more vulnerable to storms and erosion. We'll also lose an enormous amount of biological diversity, which will close the door on all kinds of new potential medicines and other benefits. Coral reefs are not condemned to extinction. Reefs are resilient and can recover, and there are ways you can help. For example, try to become more aware of the seafood you're eating, what it is, where it came from, and how it was caught. When you vacation, choose tourism and hotel operators who treat the ocean environment responsibly. Also, try to lower your CO2 footprint. Marine protected areas, a kind of aquatic nature preserve, are becoming one of the most important elements of reef conservation, and they need your support. Also, find a favorite nonprofit group that's working to help conserve coral reefs and support it. And finally, vote for a conservation candidate and spread the word. With your help, we can increase the chances that coral reefs will survive into the future and benefit people for many years to come. Learn more at wri.org slash reefs. Right. Um, sorry, there was small disturbance. Um, right. Um,
right so what solutions are there right uh, there can be many we can suggest many solutions but uh, we don't know how practical they are uh, but uh, like there are basic thing that especially the managing fisheries so the good old term what we call the sustainable management of course now we know that uh, this term has no much meaning no, nothing in the world not, not none of the resources in the world actually sustainable so but anyway if we can use some some sort of a way of doing sustainable resource extraction that would be good for the coral reefs but uh, again i'm not too sure how it's going to work right but uh, <clears throat> other than that the the other thing is the the rules and regulations especially for the protection of um, environment um, um, to get rid of the illegal fishing methods of course the even sri lanka we have a lot of stringent rules and regulation for the coral reefs but unfortunately the they are not really effective that's the problem because they are not uh, fully implemented though we have the rules and regulations uh, having rules and regulations alone is not going to work uh, we need a more practical approach um, another solution is the to increase the, the protected areas uh, even the stg like sustainable development goal suggesting to increase the at least 10 percent of the ocean to be protected if you are to think of a better management but we will talk about these things uh, perhaps uh, towards the uh, end of the our lecture series um, another thing is they're doing a lot of research and then especially this to find out exact cause of coral decline but we presume that it may be the increase in temperature or maybe it's the the, the sedimentation or other the overfishing but we really we but we are not 100 percent sure which which is actually affecting the 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 corals and then that's where um, we have to think of uh, or we need to do a lot of uh, um, research uh, that is another part uh, that we are lacking when come to the re research uh, <clears throat> right uh, and uh, the increased public education and that is one of the things especially the the people like you can do this kind of a things like even for the you have the aquatic club now the for the zoological um, club as well uh, so where you can uh, have a lot of education and awareness program for the people especially in the areas where the, the coral reefs are for the fishermen and for the tour operators uh, and that will really help uh, protecting at least some corals especially at least training the people before snorkeling right so that type of snow at least training that we are giving uh, in the swimming pools before you're taking into the coral reefs so that training is very important uh, just to get rid of uh, any issues right right um, uh, <clears throat> another very important thing is called the continuing monitoring of coral reefs right and this is another very important thing that uh, we should uh, look at or we should uh, plan the long-term monitoring of coral reef we don't have any data actually about the coral reefs at least we don't have a map of coral reefs a proper map of the coral reefs of sri lanka and then what has happened over the time to how much the the rate of degradation of coral reefs how we lost these coral reefs over the time what is the like a type of fishing affecting all this this kind of look. we can collect so much of data but uh, we don't have anything uh, and really 
actually recently we started doing some we call the reef health monitoring from uh, our research center uh, now we are continuing that uh, for like it's a long term monitoring of coral reefs uh, so any of you want to join as volunteers or right but unfortunately you need to be a diver uh, but even without diving at least if you can snorkel you can join this kind of a long term research programs if any of you is interested you can join i can update you about these things later on right <clears throat> right um um just very basic things uh, we already discussed about the the uh, another issue that i couldn't explain before that is a the the issue with the coral reefs uh, we talk about like stable a community in a population like here in the the diagram here i said coral reef is a stable community with the corals and the reef fishes the usual coral reef here it's a very stable but now there is another community here this is a, now the coral reef has turned into a, a algal reef it's all dominated by the the algae the macro algae in particular right now when the the coral reef turn into this algal reef now this one also stable but in a different level but it is stable again and in this this kind of a situation we call in the ecology as the a phase shift phase shift is one community change into a different community but both are both can be stable but different this is more diverse this is less diverse this is a total different community this different assemblage but this is again a different community but this is stable this is uh, but this can even stable because a lot of the uh, algae the primary producers which it, this can even be more uh, stable right so this is the type of uh, uh, the phase shift that we are seeing in the coral reef most of the coral reefs now used to be this reef now turning into this kind of algal reef another um, stable community here so uh, earlier we talk about this phase shifting as ecologists uh, as a sort of a concept now this has become a reality uh, changing one community into another community another stable community so so the phase shift another very important uh, concept in ecology right right <clears throat> so the protected areas another option of the best type of option that we can think of but well managed uh, protected area will be a best solution for the coral reef issue right uh, and this marine protected areas or the mps we call hope spots right the scientists call them as the hope for hope spots because that is the only hope we can think of any recovery of corals or the reef associated fish or other communities we can think of at least some recovery that when you have to think of a well managed protected areas uh, if we can uh, have more protected areas that could be the the best solution that we can have so of course we have this protected areas in hikadu the the pigeon island uh, as well as bar reef and, and uh, now even unavatuna uh, but uh, it's only the protected area but there's no any coral there it uh, now recently they are planning to um, demarcate the kayankani reef as a protected area as well so last month only i was i was in this uh, kayankani reef uh, it's also pretty much damaged now uh, perhaps i can share some of the photos later on All right so we have talked a lot on this uh, protected areas even last to i think even for the fishery so i don't want to go into very detail but uh, uh, 
um, anyway, the the protected area is going to be one best solution for the future, right? All right. Um, the other than this protected areas, there is a another um, uh, methods that use uh, some coral scientists as well as NGOs for uh, restoring corals. There are different efforts that have been uh, uh, put forward. Right. Uh, one of the best examples is this coral replanting. Right, the they replant the coral. Like here, you can see the the they use different ways of uh, replanting corals. They use this kind of metal uh, substrates or this kind of a cement blocks. Or as here also. A, um, uh, metal blocks. Right. They take small fragments from the the corals. Actually, usually it's the the break off from the coral reef. Right. Usually, you don't uh, just cut coral from the live one, but just break off during maybe some rough season. You will see this kind of break off. You take these small pieces and then they with the a, a cement they attach to here. Or oh, otherwise, in the like here, the replanted uh, like uh, there are special type of cement, and you can very easily and quickly they uh, settle. Actually, all these images are from Sri Lanka. Some like um, this, you can see the Sri Lanka police diving unit there doing this restoration program, and this one actually done by. Um, what is Dilma Conservation? Right, so this is by Sri Lanka Navy. Uh, Dilma Conservation, they are called this reef balls. Right. Uh, oh, sorry, this is a, from Tokyo cement actually. Right, so they use the concrete structures like this and they replant the coral. It looks, works really well. Right. Um, right. Uh, and here there's another um, example from a Polhena reef, Polhena in Mather, uh, using this uh, uh, PVC structures. Uh, uh, here they have re replanted the corals. This is just after seven months, seven, eight months after. You see the, the small pieces of coral. Uh, Fragments, how they, they turned into a um, considerable growth within six, seven months. You see, this is only after four months, and then uh, I think this is after seven months, right? Um, this is actually one of our students. Uh, I'm not too sure you know about this, Yamika, uh, one of the aquatic science students. He did uh, this experiment with me uh, in the whole henry. Like these, these are successful stories, but uh, uh, you see the, this is how the, with very, I mean, simple techniques, right? There is no any high-tech devices here. And even uh, you can see here some sediment trap with a, a plastic bottle, just the mega bottles making, make, Made into a, like we collected even how much sediment. And this is actually not actually only about the the reef growth. Like that also look at how the reef grow at the same time. What are the factors affecting the the we selected the natural habitat as well as non human influence area just to see what is affecting right. So so this really indicates that the replanting is not that difficult if you. Do it. Uh, you can do it. Even even previously, you have seen that uh, there is some growth in the in the uh, coral. Now the issue with this replanting is actually um, they grow like this, but after several months, after many years, so they all die. Right. The main reason, like there is a one particular reason why corals are dying. 
as far as that reason is there, the corals again die, no matter how hard you try. Right? For short period of time, they will survive, but after that again, especially during the off season or the, um, the monsoon season or the war kankal, so they will die because even we won't be able to uh, manage them during that time. Even if we won't be able to go into the see them, and that time the corals might die. Right. So that is the story about the the coral replanting. Right. There has been a lot of effort uh, around Sri Lanka for the replanting corals, but it um, so far there is no good successful stories. Uh, they work for some time, but after that, it's not really going to work, right? Um, there is another video. We can quickly go through this one as well. People come to the Great Barrier Reef and expect doomsday. It has been publicised that the Great Barrier Reef is dead. I can assure you it's definitely not dead. However, the Great Barrier Reef is under threat. There are so many animals that are relying on us. We need to do something because if we lose all of this, it's going to have a huge impact. My name's Johnny Gaskell and I'm a marine biologist on Daydream Island. We've got Luann here. How are you going, Luann? Ugh, pushy. I guess the first thing we do each day is head into the living reef, check the animals, check the corals, check the water quality. Once we've done that, we invite guests to come with us on educational tours to inspire people to want to protect the oceans through the connections that they make with the animals. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest living structure on the planet. It's a 2,300 kilometre stretch of coral reef. So all of the organisms that make up the Great Barrier Reef are colonies of animals. And these little polyps excrete calcium carbonate and make these structures underneath the soft tissue. And that's how you get your coral structure. The colour in the coral is actually an algae that lives inside the coral tissue. And that's where you get all the bright, vibrant colours. It is very important to note that although some parts of the Great Barrier Reef are still thriving, on the other side there's a lot of parts of the Great Barrier Reef that need help. If something's not done soon, we may lose these places. In 2016 and 2017, there was two mass bleaching events and because it was consecutive, it had a significant impact on the Great Barrier Reef. An estimated one third of the Great Barrier Reef was affected by this and we did lose a lot of coral. After the 2017 bleaching, we were hit with Tropical Cyclone Debbie and that cyclone was a category four that basically sat over the Whitsundays for about 30 hours. So we did lose a number of sites in the Whitsundays to cyclone damage. The day I jumped in, at Lover's Cove, after the cyclone, it was about four weeks after the cyclone. I really didn't want to get in because I kind of expected what was there. It was, it was the worst. Just having that memory of this underwater city, just with corals everywhere, fish everywhere. It's so harsh that one day you got in and you didn't realise it was your last time. So now I just want to do whatever I can to help it get back to as close as what it was as possible. There's two methods of coral propagation that we're using at the moment. Collect coral put them onto nurseries that we've actually built under the water in the marine park, and then give the corals time in these nurseries to get to a suitable size where we can then plant them back into the damaged sites. The other method 
that we're trialling here at the moment is to use coral raceways that are actually out of the water. These tubs use raw water that cycles through them to basically replenish whatever's in there. So we actually grab the corals from the wild, put them into the raceways, leave them there in the raw water as it cycles in a controlled environment for four to five months till they get to that size we need, and then outplant them back into the wild, into the sites where we've had cyclone damage. The advantage of using the raceways is it's controlled, it's right there, we have it in front of us, and if, God forbid, another cyclone comes along, at least then we have the coral fragments ready to go inside these raceways and the outplanting can be done much faster. So this is a coral raceway. This one here I actually designed late one night, some crazy idea. We're really lucky that the Queensland and Australian government actually funded this project. It's really good to get the support of the government and without them, none of this would have actually happened. It's the first time this is done in the region, so hopefully in the future, other places do the same thing. So this is a pretty exciting moment. We've got the coral raceways up and running, ready to go, and the very... <sighs> yeah. Uh, I actually haven't been in here since the cyclone, this spot. After the corals have spent a bit of time in the raceways, this is potentially one of the sites that we will aim to restore. So I'm going to jump in now with the camera and see if the corals are going to have a happy home. What I just saw down there was clear cyclone damage. It's, there's not much cover on any of the rock surfaces and the coral rubble, as far as you can see. These are coral scientists, and they need your help. There's a lot to love about coral. It grows into beautiful reefs, creates habitat for millions of species, and absorbs wave energy, protecting coastlines from erosion. But around the world, coral reefs aren't doing so well. Sometimes when conditions in the ocean change, coral expels the algae that lives inside its tissue, which can cause it to die. See, coral and algae work together in what is called an endosymbiotic relationship that has been going on for hundreds of millions of years. The coral gives algae shelter to live while the algae produces nutrients through photosynthesis for the coral to eat, up to 90% of its energy source. And to make it even better, coral then excretes ammonium waste that the algae can consume as food. But when coral and algae go their separate ways, a process called coral bleaching they are both left much less resilient. These Coral reefs are one of the world's most magical and important ecosystems. They sustain 25% of all marine life and the livelihoods of up to 1 billion people globally. But unfortunately, these reefs are dying at frightening rates. We've already lost half of the world's coral reefs and we're on track to have over 90% of reefs die in just the next 30 years. That's why we created Coral Vita, a company growing climate change resilient corals to restore our world's dying coral reefs. I'm Gator Halpern. And I'm Sam Teicher. We're the founders of Coral Vita, and we're excited to be here in Freeport, Grand Bahama at our first facility, the world's first commercial land-based coral farm for reef restoration. Working with some of the world's leading coral scientists, we use breakthrough methods like micro-fragmenting, where we can grow corals up to 50 times faster, which translates into months instead of decades, along with assisted evolution techniques, where we can strengthen corals' resiliency to threats like warming and acidifying oceans. This allows us, through our land-based farming model, to do more holistic and effective large-scale restoration around the world. After growing corals in our tanks, for six to 12 months, we then dive down into reefs, plant the corals, and help bring these marine ecosystems back to life. In addition to providing corals for reef restoration projects, our farms also function as ecotourism attractions, as well as education centers. 
From the beginning, we worked with the local communities to build stewardship over the reefs, having school groups come to our farms to learn about why corals are so important and what we can do to sustain them. Ultimately, coral reefs help feed people's families, pay the bills, and protect them against threats like storm surges. As we build coral farms around the world, we're excited to work with the communities who depend on these reefs the most. We're open for business here. Right. Uh, I hope you watch these couple of videos. Uh, they all actually mainly made for awareness. Like not some some of them are not highly scientific, but uh, uh, they are really into this uh, the coral restoration pro programs. So particularly the last one, that's Coral Vita. Uh, actually, it's a, a coral restoration using what you call the microfragmentation. That's mean the they select some good healthy corals and make it small pieces and uh, uh, they like uh, they grow in the the growth like in the in the terrestrial environment rather than directly planting in the sea. Actually, I had a video conference in uh, discussion with them how whether we can apply this one to Sri Lanka as well. So they were very, very happy that this was actually they are dying in the Bahamas, uh, one of the Caribbean islands. So they are willing that if you are, they are like, like uh, we want to collaborate to try out this kind of a method if it's going to work for Sri Lanka. I'm not too sure whether it's like, whether it's like all depend on the government, how they are supporting this kind of thing. It's this more, more or less private public partnership something like that. Uh, I'm not too sure whether we will be able to get the permission to do this kind of thing. Uh, as far as the the situation in Sri Lanka, it's so hard to get uh, permission for this kind of thing to, to, to my knowledge, right? But anyway, so that's the situation with the coral reefs. Uh, so the as undergraduate, so the future scientists, so future resource managers, you have a lot of responsibilities. Uh, um, as we all know, this perhaps we or the you will be the last generation to see this coral reef. So there are much responsibility for you, especially for people who are doing the aquatic resources management as well as zoology as a subject. Um, yes, so you have huge tasks to do. I mean, join you can uh, have either awareness programs or you can have this kind of a restoration program so at least join this kind of a group where you can work with um, because there is no many people that are working on this subject all right uh, that's all for the day um, almost uh, one and a half hours more than that i hope uh, you enjoyed this uh, i hope you enjoyed um, uh, very important topic of coral reefs. So I spent a little bit more time on the corals, considering the importance of coral reef uh, ecosystems out of the other um, ecosystems. So, right. So the next week, uh, so perhaps we can have the lectures this uh, this time, or if you want different time, let me know. Perhaps this time is good. Uh, um, all right, so I have a question here from Abhayavadana. Can we consider coral replanting as kind of a farm in the seas? Um, good question. Uh, well, sometimes we call this at the coral farming, but uh, the thing is when we put that term as the coral farming, the farming something related, doing it for business, uh, doing it for profit, right? So, but in the case of coral, we are not doing it for a business, not for profit, right? That's where we use the term more coral gardening, right? 
So gardening we do at home as well. It's not doing for business, maybe for our interest sometimes, but more we use the term coral gardening or coral replanting. And the best or the more scientific terms we use the coral replanting. Right. Uh, it's not wrong to use the farming. It's, it's a way of farming. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, if you use the term farming, you, you won't be able to get the, the license for the wildlife. Uh, other than that, of course, uh, that won't be a big, I mean, there's nothing wrong. You can use that term. All right, uh, anyone else has questions? Before winding up. So, 